for. So I think it's really important. Um, okay, cool. So what are we doing? Um, so, okay, so last time, last time uh, we finished natural selection, right? So we looked at examples of natural selection, how different environmental stressors or what I, or we refer to as selective pressures, predation, disease, um, food, availability, uh, these kinds of things, how they can select for individuals in a population that is, uh, that varies in its traits. It selects for the ones that vary in that way that makes them more likely to survive and reproduce. Um, so this one, the antibiotic resistance, the antibiotics kill all bacteria except for the ones that have that resistance gene and they can survive in that pre the presence of that antibiotic. They go on to divide and produce more bacterial cells. Um, so that's that fundamental basis of natural selection. So kind of a quick review there. Just looking at these. Um, incorrect. So we, we talked about how it's not really in this achievement of a goal, but rather it's this random process, right? This random process whereby, uh, depending on the environment that these organisms are in, uh, the, the ones that are better suited to that environment, right? They are more um, adapted. They have characteristics or traits that allow them to survive in that environment. Um, they'll be selected upon to survive um, in that environment. Uh, but but it's not really a goal oriented process. It's remember we've discussed how these populations with uh, variability in their genes is very. It's just random how this happens. I was just reading the textbook today about MRSA. I don't know if you've heard of MRSA, but MRSA was or is this bacterial species of Staphylococcus aureus that is resistant to an antibiotic known as methicillin. Methicillin resistant Staph aureus. So what happens is in a population, so this is this is the key that I was reading about it just today. Um, we the antibiotic methicillin did not create these bacteria. When we started to kill staph infections with methicillin, we didn't we didn't create this bug. We didn't create this resistant strain by doing that. We selected for it when it randomly appeared in that population. It randomly came about, and the reason it was able to outcompete the other bacteria in that massive infection or massive colony population of bacterial cells is because we killed every single one of them except them. <laughs> they went on to live and survive, procreate, pass on those resistance genes to their uh, daughter cells or their offspring, the the new cells that were created, uh, so forth, so forth, they divide, 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 they're passing on their genes. Bacteria can also do this crazy thing where they pass genes to one another, not just their children, their uh, offspring. Uh, so resistance quickly spread. And I think I read in like five years, like 20%, it went from like 1% to 20%. We, we actually selected for these resistant bacteria. Um, in that in that way, so crazy. Okay. Oh, is it freezing a lot? Uh, yeah, I tried to figure this out. Um, so let me think. Freezing on Friday. Oh, not temperature. <laughs> no, the, the screen, screen, not the weather. 
because uh, I can always try. I just don't want the Zoom to crash or slash. Like I'd have to email out again. I want to get going here. Um, okay. No freezes. Yeah. Um, as long as you can hear me. There might be some delays and stuff. I, like I said, I wrote it down to figure out tonight uh, what's going on because it's annoying. If this, yeah, this thing isn't flashing anymore. So somehow my update like deactivated this, which is super annoying, but whatever, I'll figure it out. Well, that's a bummer. I don't want you to have to rewatch. Um, I can try something really quick. Let me try. Okay, I hope it doesn't crash or anything, but let me try because this is connect. Hit connect. Is it working? No. Ah, oh, whatever. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that's a bummer. I'll have to try it again um, after the lecture. Sorry about that. Yeah, fortunately I am recording, but okay. Where did everyone, oops, got it. Back to sharing my screen. Okay. So today we're gonna focus on a couple new aspects of evolution, uh, kind of uh, not focus as much on natural selection, but other ways that organisms evolve, uh, one of which is called artificial, artificial selection. Uh, so this is when us human beings select for certain organisms with desired traits. Pull up my notes here. So artificial selection is really when humans would do what we call selective breeding, okay? And uh, it would be for the purpose, do you guys see this antivirus thing? It keeps popping up. It's so annoying. So I'd have to, it's cause I updated my computer, but super annoying. Anyways, um, so, Okay, um, where was I? Uh, we're, so through artificial selection, by our actions, okay, we are uh, selecting, choosing traits that are desirable to us for some, typically an economic purpose, okay? Uh, so a few examples. Belgian blue cattle for increased meat production, thoroughbred horses, because uh, they are really fast, they have good stamina, those kinds of things. Breeds of dogs, one of my favorites. So essentially this process, by the way, all dogs have a recent common ancestor of the wolf. Um, probably, oh man, is it 75 million years ago, something like that, um, where dogs basically, the, the, all dogs came from wolves. They descended from wolves. Uh, your five pound chihuahua begs to differ. So <laughs> exactly. So that's kind of the, the point here of artificial, oh my goodness, Sophos antivirus, shut up. Um, it is gross, I agree. Is this GMO? So no, 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 this isn't GMO. Uh, it's a great uh, guess though. It's a great assumption because um, 
GMOs off are that's produced by a laboratory technique, uh, and uh, this lab technique, we're kind of modifying the genome or of like a bacterial cell, and then it can produce a protein of interest kind of thing. Um, whereas artificial selection is basically when you have a litter of dogs, you're selecting the cute fluffy ones and then breeding those. And then, so you're selecting traits that are desirable over thousands of years uh, and breeding them only and breeding those ones with the traits that you find that are desirable for some reason. Um, yeah, GMOs are more, uh, more of the laboratory procedure, um, but it is a way of, of artificial means to generate an organism, but this is more selective breeding. So one of my favorite examples here. So these vegetables all came from wild mustard, kale, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, broccoli, uh, so the wild mustard plant has a bunch of variations and farmers would breed, for example, variations of this mustard that had larger flowers and stems. And once they would keep doing that, uh, these traits would, um, by breeding the ones with the traits that they liked or desired, uh, kept producing offspring with those traits. Kind of like with the dogs, if you you had a litter and one of the dogs was smaller and you breed the smaller dogs together and they get smaller and smaller. Of course, this is sort of exaggerated, but over time you get all these variations and, oh, this one's adorable or whatever. Um, I guess the point here is that natural selection and survival is not choosing who reproduces just by means of surviving to reproduce. Um, but it's the human choosing who reproduces for that, uh, I you know, where for whatever purpose it is for a racehorse or uh, a pet, that kind of thing. Okay, any questions about that? Oh, wow. See, that's really interesting what Itzel said in the chat. So, um, yeah, so essentially these breeders will just breed snakes and the offspring, the baby snakes, by mutation, as we've learned, the more you breed, right, you're going to get higher chance of mutations in these new alleles, new traits arising. And then, whoa, this, this baby snake has this incredible pattern. So I'm going to take it and breed it with that snake with that incredible pattern, breed them. And then all of a sudden you get all these variations and it's just purely economic and it's not right. It's not, oh, this snake with that pattern was camouflaged better. So it was able to survive and reproduce and give rise to more of those snakes by having offspring and passing that on, right? Um, we did it, <laughs> we did it. So that's artificial selection. And unfortunately, Nicole, I don't think your chihuahua would have a, a good shot at uh, natural selection, those forces that exist. Um, I think he'd be a yummy snack for the lion on the Sahara, but probably really a cute dog. And I, you know, <laughs> she's pretty evil. I <laughs> think she could be a lion. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe so. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, anyways, okay. <laughs> That's funny. All right, get some water. All right, so this next one, another interesting variation here. Oh, there's no. Okay, so I'm gonna write on the board for this one. This is sexual selection. 
which is sometimes grouped in with natural selection, but um, let me go ahead and write it up here. And it's sometimes grouped with natural selection because depending on an individual's traits in this circumstance, it'll determine whether or not that individual or, uh, is likely to survive and reproduce. And in this case, it has to do with whether or not um, a female will reproduce with the male most often. Uh, it's pretty interesting. So the definition here is that female mate choice leads to the selection of certain traits in males. Uh, for example, color fe uh, colorful feathers of the male peacock. So what's going on here is here are a few, a couple examples. Um, so if you didn't know, these peacocks with the long, colorful trains here, those are the males, and this is a peahen. That's the female. Again, here's the male with the cool feather plumage and that's the female. So what's happening here is, it's kind of funny. It's um, the males, the more extravagant and, you know, colorful and big and noticeable they are, the female actually will notice the male and reproduce with the male simply because they're more noticeable <laughs> or, uh, you know, so they, or they're, you know, doing a dance or whatever. Um, and so that's a highly selected, uh, that's a very powerfully favorable trait to have because more noticeable uh, peacocks, right, are going to reproduce more and pass on more of those, that same gene. If you're not as noticeable, you're not gonna reproduce, you die out similar to natural selection where you don't reproduce as much because you died. You don't have that trait that allows you to because it caused you to die in that scenario. Um, but this is more, am I reproducing because the female notices me or not? Um, there's also been some studies about how the offspring have better health anyway. Um, and so they live longer and have more, re there's a correlation there, but I just want you to know that this sort of, uh, you know, the way they look is highly beneficial in this scenario, um, being more noticeable and whatever it is. So that's sexual selection. Um, okay, questions about that? So that's a great question. So Sana, um, so now, yeah, so far, 
we've gone over three in total, natural selection, artificial selection, and sexual selection. Yeah. These are all different mechanisms that can cause evolution in a population. Yeah, so this lecture really is devoted a lot to the variations on evolution um, and then other aspects to it. So another misconception. So this actually is directly related to Sana's comment. Uh, what is incorrect about this statement about natural selection? Natural selection and evolution are the same thing. What do you guys think? Why is that incorrect? Mary is on the right track, exactly. So natural selection can absolutely cause evolution, a change in it over time, right? Um, uh, so we have to be careful. So essentially the reason natural selection and evolution are not the same, evolution, uh, is as we've seen this change in a population's traits over time. Evolution can happen from a few thousand years to a few million to really billions of years and it's still happening. Um, but we see this change in how the population looks over time, acts, uh, characteristics, right? And the, the genes involved. So what this misconception is speaking to is what causes that? can be different. Natural selection is one mechanism that can drive evolutionary change. It's the primary one. But the sort of point I want to emphasize here is that um, another way I like to put it is, and as we're seeing, we're discussing all these different variations, these other mechanisms that can cause evolution. Uh, all all examples of natural selection are evolution, however, or they'll cause evolution. However, all causes of evolution are not natural selection, okay? There's other ways, uh, such as artificial selection. And we're gonna talk about one now, uh, sexual selection and genetic drift, which we're gonna get into. No, we're not goal, no, not goal oriented, never. Um, it's a random process. There's no goal in mind. Remember, so the methicillin resistant gene came about uh, randomly. The bacteria didn't say, uh-oh, this hospital is giving us methicillin. I better mutate willingly and be resistant to it and pump it back out or something of my cell or chop it up. Um, that happens randomly. Bacteria divide so quickly and these mutations accumulate so quickly that that happened. And then all of a sudden, when we gave methicillin to the patient, that bacterial cell that randomly had that resistance was able to live. It wasn't killed. Um, so natural selection is this process that acts on existing variations, random existing variations that came up, but very, purposely acts on um, those existing variations and acts on the specific one that gives a survival advantage. That's natural selection. So there's no goal in mind. It's sort of this random process and it's sort of directed, it's kind of both. Randomly generating new alleles in a population, but a very purposeful acting upon those alleles, killing off those with harmful ones and keeping those alive that have survival uh, enhancement, right? Camouflage or um, we saw malaria with, or again, sickle cell against malaria, we saw antibiotic resistance. 
um, and the finches being able to obtain food, right? And the longer beaks, is that ringing a bell? But that's natural selection. So sexual selection is just what the male looks like. <laughs> um, can he reproduce more? Because the female's like, whoa, I like your feathers. <laughs> um, okay. So natural selection is one mechanism that causes evolution in a population. There you go. One mechanism of evolution. So the next few mechanisms I want to discuss is, oops, falls under, these two mechanisms fall under the same category called genetic drift. These are other mechanisms that can cause evolution. Okay. Genetic drift. So genetic drift, genetic changes that occur in populations Um, underline this, due to random events, not natural selection. And there are going to be two mechanisms of genetic drift that we're going to talk about. Um, here we go. Okay, so genetic drift is random. This is when this change over time occurs by randomly. Now, I've mentioned random, right? How, how variation comes about is random mutations, right? Uh, natural selection, as I mentioned, I'm glad I kind of brought it up again because it is this very deliberate, specific selection for individuals, right? The ones that were camouflaged in the canyon, the one with larger beaks to obtain food, kind of specifically selected for them, right? Genetic drift, selects for no one. It's random. It selects for certain ones to survive and reproduce at a random. Now, how could that be? There's two famous mechanisms for it. The first is called the founder effect. So let me get my notes. First is called the founder effect. Let's do it in red. Actually, let's do blue. I'm going to do blue because this is all genetic drift. Where blue is genetic drift. So founder effect. And this is when a small group of individuals
these are the founders, establish a new population elsewhere. New population elsewhere. Bringing their alleles with them, their genes, the, the versions of their genes, right? Bringing their alleles with them. Okay, so founder effect, let's talk about what it is first. So if we have, for example, the colonies, what was it, 1700s? The colonies that, the 13 colonies right on the East Coast, um, if we have these towns and um, these uh, settlements with all these people, and then all of a sudden a small group of them, let's say like 20, go away, they migrate, they move and establish a brand new colony or town in Pennsylvania. Well, that's a small gene pool to start out with. It's a that's a very small uh, set of genes to start out with. So if one of them has a disease or the gene for a disease, that in the reproduction and keeping in that new town and civilization or population there, it's gonna be preserved, right? It's gonna be kind of kept within um, and amplified versus having that disease in a town of, you know, 100,000 or whatever. Um, but really these, for generations, this disease is going to be propagated and kept there because it was such a small group to begin with. Um, so an example of this would be the Amish. So here are the, some Amish folk. Uh, so the child, I don't know how to pronounce the syndrome, Ellis Van Creveld syndrome uh, has extra digits, polydactyly. So six fingers on each hand, um, short stature, uh, et cetera. So this is an example of one of these rare diseases that is prevalent. It's common in the Amish society because the very founders of the Amish community, uh, one of them carried that allele. And so the odds are that that allele is going to present more frequently versus if 20 out of those 20 individuals that stayed in a population of a million, 100,000, 50,000, versus 20 and you know reproducing and keeping it within that community it's going to propagate over generations but it won't be diluted out does that make sense so the other the reason this is random is because the 20 people in my example that broke off are random uh they could have had a different re recessive disorder brought with them they happened to be Amish, they wanted to break away. So that was a little purposeful in that regard. Um, but that has nothing to do with biology, right? Their genes were random. These are random folk. Their religious preference is, doesn't determine their genes and vice versa. Um, so that's why they consider founder effect genetic drift. Um, could have been 20 other people that wanted to become Amish, right? It's subtle, but that's why it's considered genetic drift. 20 random people, essentially. Okay. The 
The other example of genetic drift is called the bottleneck effect. So that's my picture. Uh, so we'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, so the bottleneck effect. This is when a small population decreases in size. Due to a natural disaster. So, such as, just get you guys to, to answer, um, what are some natural disasters <laughs> that I could write in? Earthquakes. Tsunami, <laughs> nice. Yeah, not nice, it's bad. I'll just, Keep going. Fires, floods, hurricane, you name it. It's good enough. Um, so this leads to, so let's say, well, I wouldn't say plague. Uh, it's more of an environmental disaster. Plagues actually would select on immunocompromised people. Um, I would consider that under natural selection, like disease. But um, I don't know, sometimes really bad plagues you know, they can freaking kill everybody. I don't know, that's, it's in depth. Anyway, uh, I'd have to think about it. To a natural design leading to, again, a random loss of alleles in the population. Okay, so a little diagram I like to draw for bottleneck. So this circle here re um, represents our population, okay, of let's say mice. And hold on, let me think for a minute. Okay, this is my population of mice, the red and the black mice, right? And I'm just pretending here that the red color, that just it represents a better adapted mouse, like a mouse that has a better chance of surviving. Maybe it's more camouflaged, maybe it's faster than the black mice and can get food better. This is what bottleneck does. It just, an earthquake just killed all of these mice. And these are the ones that are left. There are now more, ah, Sophos, go away. I gotta fix that. There are now more weaker, weaker, um, you know, less fit, right? Mice for survival. 
in that population. There is the presence of more harmful alleles or less adapted um, survival alleles. So you understand, I could have drawn this X here. Earthquakes, fires, floods, tornadoes, you name it. They don't care if you're better at surviving in that environment. They'll kill anything in a random fashion, a non-selective way. So that's why a bottleneck is considered uh, genetic drift. And I was just reading actually an example in the textbook of prairie, uh, was it prairie chickens, hen, I don't know, something uh, in the Midwest. And once they did a study and once humans turned it into farmland, it actually just kind of, I mean, this isn't really bottleneck because it's not a natural disaster, but um, it actually, it was just a, a case study and it was um, basically they looked at the ones on the farmland versus wild hens or chickens or whatever. And they saw that the ones on the farmland were much less, or they gave the eggs that they hatched didn't, didn't survive past reproductive age. Um, they were unhealthy, they were less healthy versus the ones that were wild were healthier. And I think, you know, with additional data, they concluded that it was a genetic drift sort of thing where farmland and farming kind of led to the decrease of them because we were chopping down trees or, I don't know, don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, but anyways, that's the, that's the phenomenon. So that's, those are the two examples of genetic drift. Are there any questions about genetic drift before we move on to our, I believe our last mechanism that can cause evolution? Pull up my notes here. Yes, it is our last mechanism. Oh, yeah, yeah, board closer, I just saw that. So you see though that natural selection would actually select for the better suited mice to survive. But because bottlenecks random, less adapted mice lived. Okay. So one more way in which a population can change its alleles, its traits over time. It's called, and it's not genetic drift. Um, it's not considered genetic drift. I think it's not as random. Um, I think th there's more purpose involved, but it has to do with migration. And it's called gene flow. Gene flow. So let's go to my slides. Oh, this is the bottleneck, by the way. So a bottleneck just means only a few survive, right? And then there's that natural disaster that killed off all these people. And now there's more of the orange, et cetera. The red completely died out. Okay, let's take a look at gene flow. Gene flow is genetic change that occurs in a population because 
was of the migration of new individuals into and out of existing populations. Populations. Okay, so you have more than one population, right? Migration between the two. So in this example, we have a, a mountain range and a small pass with the Western deer population and Eastern deer population, different fur color, right? So that you have two different alleles. Uh, and really this represents an entirely different mix of genes, right? Uh, and when they cross the pass and mate with one another, you're introducing these new alleles, right? To this population. You're also losing them from this population. So both are changing uh, due to this uh, effect. But that's gene flow. Genes are flowing. <laughs> and yeah, so like neighboring islands of birds and lakes and um, things like that, this can this can happen too. Um, That's it, really. Um, so, oh, let's do a fun uh, practice thing. <laughs> so, in 2004, oops, sitting on my eraser, scientists announced the discovery of fossil remains of uh, extremely short early humans on the Indonesian island of Flores. They named it these species Homo florens, floresen, floresiensis. <laughs> Floresiensis, there you go. Um, they're about three feet tall. They hypothesized that it, uh, this species evolved from Homo erectus, another early human species, when they became isolated on the remote island of Flores. What event does this represent? What type of evolution event? What do you think? Founder, artificial or sexual. Um, so it's death. It's founder effect. Okay. So the reason, uh, so they found the key here is that it's an isol. They became isolated on a remote island. So this sort of breaking off from an original population, having a brand new population on this remote area where they can interbreed, um, preserving those genes they brought with them, say one of them was shorter. Um, so it's a founder effect type situation. Um, yeah, for it to be gene flow, it would have to sort of include another population that uh, migrated to the island or left the island um, and entered a new one. Uh, what else? Yeah, so the, the best thing would be um, founder effect. 
So natural disasters was the bottleneck. That was specifically bottleneck. Founder effect can be geographical change. Yeah, yeah, it's primarily geographical change. But the, the key with the founder effect is when part of an original population establishes or founds a new population, either by another island or another uh, city, another land mass of some kind. If a small group of us left and colonized Mars, that would be founder effect. Take our alleles with us, right? Um, okay, cool. I think we are trying to colonize Mars. At, at least I think Elon Musk is. Um, he's doing everything, I think. All right, cool. He's trying, yeah. Okay, so the remainder of the lecture is we're gonna see how far we get. That's kind of how I do this. It's um, I have a ton of info and it's really fascinating and it's uh, the sort of evidence data compiled that support evolution by natural selection and these other mechanisms. And there's three key pieces of information that we rely on. Part two. Oh, what is evolution? Oh, so this is sort of a review. And um, I do like to elaborate a bit more on uh, what Darwin meant by evolution. So we've been saying change over time, right? Uh, this change in the irritable characteristics over time. Uh, and that's what Darwin means, uh, but he was a little more specific and I kind of typed out this definition. Um, so essentially he described evolution. He actually never used the word evolution, interestingly enough. Um, it was, it's the last word in his book, uh, evolved kind of his conclusion, but he described this process as descent with modification, meaning that all the organisms on the planet have shared ancestry. And so we have shared characteristics, which we'll see a bit of that tonight um, if we have time. But all life has shared characteristics in some way, but obviously we're all very different from jellyfish, right? We're very different from unicellular bacteria. Um, so they've these shared characteristics have been modified over time, uh, which we learn these new characteristics come about by mutations, which are going to be selected for, depending on what gives you survival advantage or helps you mate more if it's sexual selection or um, random, right? This can be totally random as we've seen. Um, so yeah, I just like to kind of talk about that as we explore sort of the history, because the first evidence we're going to see of evolution is fossil record. Oh, and this is actually, this is cool. So this is from uh, on top of, uh, or in line with descent with modification, um, the, uh, this shared ancestry, right? This is actually from Darwin's book. Um, and he wrote, I think it's a very famous picture amongst biologists. Some people, I don't think people have, them have it tattooed. I hope not, but, um, you know, they have posters and I see it in biology departments and stuff, but this is exactly what he was thinking that all these organisms, D group B, C came from common ancestors. Um, and so the common ancestor of B and C would be here. There's a common ancestor here that links all of B, et cetera. Um, but he reasoned that all life came from one common ancestor, which was a pretty radical idea at the time. Um, 
but uh, let's take a look at the updated version. This is the updated version uh, from the textbook. And this is actually compressed really a lot um, and represents 4.6 billion years of evolution. It's how old the earth is and um, uh, when life first emerged, it was like 3.8 billion years ago, and it was bacteria, the first life form, uh, that we still see today. We see all of these today. Uh, but this is sort of this idea of descent with modification where um, all living things are related in some way, descending from common ancestors, uh, you know, some more common to certain organisms than others, um, which makes them more related, right? Um, and uh, of course, there's this modification where mutations came about, DNA changes that ultimately produce new traits, which in different environments offered selective advantages, um, depending on if you're a fish or a bird. <laughs> okay. Oh, so this is something I like to talk about because sometimes people will say, oh, we came from chimps or we came from monkeys. It's actually not true. Uh, what modif- oh, wait a sec. Would modification occur if one of them goes extinct? No. That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, that happens a lot, Mod uh, extinction. And let's see. So um, what happens is that if a species of say fungi go extinct uh, or even the dinosaurs, um, only the living, you know, they are, they are modified up to that point. But once the species goes extinct, we consider it, you know, it's, it hasn't, it won't emerge again. It won't be modified anymore. Um, so that's, that's a great question. It kind of ends there for that organism. Uh, so it's a good question. Humans evolved from chimpanzees. So this is not true. Um, this kind of speaks to what I was saying with common ancestry. Um, Oh, I don't have the right answer. I got to fix my slides. But um, we actually, Joey's right on top of it. That's exactly correct. So we didn't come from chimpanzees, but we share a pretty recent, granted pretty recent in evolutionary time is five million years, but Humans and chimpanzee have 98% DNA similarity. You take the DNA of my cell and a chimpanzee's cell and it has 98% the same. It's pretty amazing. Um, so we're very similar. And it has to do with the fact that we had it, we diverged from an ancestor five, approximately 5 million years ago. Yeah, 98% is actually, chimpanzees are probably, they're, I think they're our closest relative as far as the animal kingdom. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's the idea. We had a common ancestor. Um, I have to fix my slides. <laughs> um, approximately five, but we didn't come from them. We diverged out, similar to that picture with the branching from a common ancestor. Um, So with how much time do we have? 10 minutes. So let's see how far we can get. Just want to talk a little bit about the evidence for evolution. What evidence supports this theory by common descent? Fossils. Oops, let's keep that up for a moment. So let's define fossils.
So fossils are the preserved remains. Fossils are the preserved remains, tracks, or traces. So this is kind of like cave drawings, stone tools, things like that. Um, of once living organisms. And I'll add something of a, a uh, what's the word, refresher? No, callback to the first unit when we talk about isotopes. So the way that we can date these fossils, determine how old they are, is by radioactive dating or radioactive isotopes. Remember these are unstable isotopes that decay over time and we can tell how much has decayed and we know how long it takes for half of it to decay uh, a so-called half-life right uh, so for instance carbon 14 you find it in a fossil and um, i believe half of it takes about 5,000 years to decay um, so radioactive isotopes to uh, determine age of the fossils. Okay, let's take a look at another example of really interesting fossils that have been found pretty recently. Oh, here are some more uh, examples. Footprints, uh, this is actually thought to be the common ancestor of chimps and humans called Australopithecus. Uh, you don't have to know that. Transitional fossils are very interesting. Um, so let's write. I didn't use green tonight. So transitional fossils Uh, demonstrate a change in the physical features of an organism um, as it evolves a new way of life. So let me write that. new way of life.
Okay. So here's a two examples. Um, so this fossil actually, uh, it's in, no, it's, okay. It's um, called Tiktaalik. It was uh, it's estimated to be 375 million years old. And it represents the transition from fish to amphibian. So from water to land. So that's a huge, you know, uh, all life was in the oceans. Um, I mean, at, at this point, all vertebrate life, as like us, were in the oceans. And Tiktaalik was one of the first organisms to transition from sea to land. And so its fins have bone forelimbs. Uh, so it was kind of like crawling onto land. <laughs> um, and you can see that in this really well-preserved fossil. Um, this fossil is of a reptile becoming bird-like, as you can see with the feathers. Uh, and this was, um, yeah, so the reptilian sort of feet had, I believe it had teeth as well. Um, so yes, that was that example. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about tonight, because we don't have time to do everything, but that's all right, is homologous structures. In fact, maybe I'll continue this next time. Um, that might be a good idea. Yeah. I can do that. Let me see here. Okay. So what is two minutes left? Let's start homologous structures at least. Homologous structures. This is the second piece of evidence. We're moving away from fossils now. Okay. Homologous structures. So we're entering anatomical evidence. And these homologous structures will really uh, demonstrate that there's this common ancestry of all organisms, a sh shared traits um, amongst um, all organisms in some, in some way. And so homologous structures are structures with the same basic anatomy but not necessarily the same function. Okay, so what time is it? Uh, where'd it go? Oh, 6.50. So I'm gonna start here next time. I think that's a good place to, to stop. And we can talk about how this relates to the, what I was talking about when it comes to shared ancestry with similar characteristics among all life being modified depending on the environment there that the organism is in. Um, and selected for different variations of this common sort of structure. And we're gonna take a look at um, some of these structures next time. So are there any questions about anything?
hopefully my um, I can get my Ethernet fixed. My hardwire connection here. I'm gonna work on that right now, actually. Any questions? Send you all the lab info. Do you know another? Yeah, so the so the lectures don't relate too much to the lab. It's what, like maybe the only lab that's kind of different. Like I said, I don't really like to talk anatomy physio. I think this is way more relevant and interesting in my opinion. So Steve's, yeah, Steve's video, I'm gonna send that out to you. It should be enough. Um, this lab is pretty casual. I think a lot of the, most of the info's in there. Um, when I did it on ground, it's kind of like, I gave a tiny, tiny lecture at the very beginning about basic digestive system, uh, cardiovascular, you know, <laughs> I haven't done physio in a long time, physiology, but okay. Um, what else? Is there something else? I think that's it. Yeah. I feel like there was something else I'm forgetting. Anyways. Um, yeah. So Wednesday, see you guys and, uh, have a great night. Yeah. Thank you all. <laughs>